this is going to be the one of uh, one of things <laughs> just taking a uh, uh, resting from the the series which we will continue and uh, i recently sent some notes about the crusades to anil i think anil you received that didn't you right uh, we couldn't find that uh, recording so in case anybody wants notes on crusades i could uh, send you that okay uh, i'll introduce the uh, sessions and of course om prakash is with us he's a birthday boy today and uh, we want to wish him many many happy returns yeah anybody wants to do that happy at this birthday, moment before we start um, happy birthday god bless uh, thank you uh, to you all uh, <laughs> Right, sir. Yeah, enjoy, enjoy a, a lovely meal with some libation. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Right. Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce what we'll do today. So uh, let us ask for God's uh, presence with us today, and request Pastor Praveen to lead us in an opening prayer. Let's pray, <clears throat> Father. Thank you so very much, Lord, for giving another opportunity that we brothers in Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ could come together and to meditate on your word, encourage each other with your word, O oh Lord. And especially, we may study the revelation of Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask you to speak to us through your servant and you reveal yourself to us not just to us, but in us, and uh, we may be able so that we may be able to experience it more intimately, Lord. Every time we meet here may be a time of blessing for us, and uh, may this may add more uh, grace to our relationship with you, and where we can experience you uh, in a profound manner, very intimately. We ask you to bless our time together here, and our discussions may be helpful to all of us, and may be. Uh, edifying and equipping. Through everything we do, your name be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Praveen. And uh, welcome again. Mano has just joined us. Uh, uh, glad we can all be here together. So today, um, like I said, it will just be uh, one, one of those one-off things. Uh, and we are going to uh, view a video. This is from our GCI, your included series that we have. Um, the um, video, uh, the subject is titled uh, Jesus' Exclusive Connection to Human Nature. And uh, the person in conversation is Dr. Janine Graham, of course, interviewed by Dr. Gary Dedo, who is uh, a professor in our. Uh, uh, in our seminary, Grace Communion Seminary. Um, Dr. Uh, Janine Graham is an associate professor of religious studies in one of the universities in the US. And interestingly, she has a PhD from the University of Aberdeen in Scotland under James Torrance. So uh, the Torrance brothers that you might have heard have a very strong emphasis on a Trinitarian uh, perspective. Uh, so as I had written in the uh, uh, little short clip uh, on the, on the, on, in the message, she is uh, basically trying to explain to us uh, Christ's, how Christ is one for the many and how that translates into redemption of all of humanity. Um, so what I plan to do is uh, listen to the video and I picked out some comments that she makes and I thought maybe it would be interesting for us to just, uh, you know, reiterate that. As you uh, watch or watch the video, maybe there may be comments that she makes that might strike you as special or unique, you may want to just jot them down and bring it up in the discussion session. 
I felt that it would be appropriate for us to have this video because it is one, one of our very powerful um, doctrines of the church, which is the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and it is also appropriate to meditate on this message uh, because we just you know, came away from remembering the crucifixion of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the ascension of Jesus. So, um, uh, and also I was just noticing that it tends to complement what uh, Pastor Praveen had mentioned and Pastor Sachin had mentioned. It will it will sort of reinforce some of those points that they themselves brought from their Bible studies. So, uh, so let's go ahead and roll the video, and then, like I said, I'll come back for some comments. Jot down any comments you'd like to make. Well, welcome once again. Thank you. It's great to have you here. I know uh, at another area of interest uh, that you've written about is uh, what's called the one and the many. And you reflected, I, you wrote a, a journal article uh, on this, um, and especially James Torrance's understanding of the one and the many. Uh, but I really never, growing up myself, mm -hmm. never heard much about that. Um, tell us what your interest uh, was uh, why I'm talking about Jesus as the, the, the one for the many. Well, my upbringing never, I never heard that either. So it wasn't until I studied with him that that novel concept came. But it, it was related to the representation substitution theme that I talked about earlier. Um, <clears throat> he gave me a, a category, I guess, by which, a lens by which to look at the scriptures. And so um, you can see that running through numerous uh, places. One place is um, when God establishes a covenant with Abraham. Uh, usually I ask my students when I've taught Bible survey, uh, after um, we talk about the creation stories in Genesis 1 and 2, and then things get wrecked up in Genesis 3 and St. Mm -hmm. Andrews and all mm -hmm. hell breaks loose and <laughs> alienation <laughs> abounds. And yeah. So I said, okay, for 30 seconds, I want you to, this is your chance to be God, and how would you fix the situation? go. <laughs> so they talk to their neighbor and come up with all sorts of solutions. And most of them have these mega instantaneous by fiat, God changes things just mm, like that. Mm. And, um, uh, but then somehow that sacrifices free will. And so we've got to work that in. And um, they never come up with a biblical <laughs> solution. Mm. I said, well, those are very interesting. That's not the choice that God made. So God begins to, to fix the solution one person at a time one person. Hmm. He identifies Abraham. Through Abraham, he gives these promises to Abraham. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless those who bless you. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to give you many descendants. And so Abraham all, has all these promises. And then God says, I want you to pick up, pack up, go to this place I'll give you. Um, he doesn't have an itinerary. He doesn't know where God is going to lead him. It would have been an interesting conversation with Sarai. Where, where are we going? I don't know. Why are we going? I don't know. <laughs> but God told us so. So that becomes the beginning of the covenant relationship. And through a, this one person, he's going to begin to build a people hmm. um, who become the, the people of Israel. And then God chooses this people, insignificant people, could have chosen any group, but mm. chooses his people to be the vehicle, the vessel through whom God is going to work his covenant purposes out to eventually gather all nations to himself. Um, he's not going to opt for the fiat solution. He's going to, to sidle up to these people, to enter into a relationship with these people. And through their history, the world will see something of the heart of who God is and something of the desperate need of, of human nature, the human condition. Um, and what a great privilege for Israel to be that vessel, but also a great responsibility to try and live up to that covenant partnership, to be that faithful covenant partner. Um, meanwhile, in their history, um, there are one in the many uh, instances. Uh, the Levites are one of the 12 tribes. Mm, the, 12, the 11 tribes are given uh, land. Uh, but the Levites are not given land because they're going to be interspersed with all of the tribes to be kind of the worship coordinators of the tribe. Um, so they have a special mission as the one to 
bless and benefit the mm -hmm. many. So that's a uh, piece. Um, after God delivers Israel from Egypt, um, there's a, 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 a sacrifice that God institutes uh, by which God is going to redeem the firstborn sons of Israel. Mm -hmm. The last plague that forced the hand of, of um, Pharaoh to let my mm -hmm. people go mm -hmm. and let the exodus happen was the killing of the firstborn, um, except that the children of Israel were protected um, and so the angel of death passed over their, um, uh, their houses, protecting their firstborn. But, but um, the sacrifice was to redeem the firstborn uh, on whom God had a claim. And the firstborn are representing the many people of Israel. So you have that scene entering there. Mm -hmm. um, probably the, the one that stands out the best, uh, the most uh, vivid to me was one that Torrance mentions constantly in his writings and teachings. The, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest, mm -hmm. the Old Testament high priest, um, on one day of the year, around October or so, um, would, is going to act on behalf of the many, the people of Israel. And he um, uh, washes himself, special cleansing, uh, to cleanse himself from his own sin, because he's a human sinner as well. He puts on certain special vestments. He sets himself apart. He sanctifies himself to do this act on behalf of the people. And then the people come symbolically with their collective uh, year-long <laughs> collection of sins. And there's two sacrificial animals. He lays his hand on one um, and uh, uh, banishes it, it with the weight of the sins of the people are laid on that, per, on that lamb. He's identifying with the righteousness of God. We are guilty. You are right to judge us. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, lay our sins uh, symbolically on this lamb and he's read in, uh, led into the wilderness to take the sins of the people away. The other lamb is slain, the blood is collected and taken into the Holy of Holies. All up to this point, the high priest is acting on behalf of all the people. Mm. He's the one representative the one. acting on behalf of the many. So he goes in with this blood uh, sacrifice before the Holy of Holies, pleading with God to remember his covenant relationship, to forgive the people, um, to restore them to right relationship. And then when he comes out of the Holy of Holies, now he's representing God to the people. Before he was representing the people to God, now he's representing God to the people with the blessing of peace, the assurance of, of restoration. That covenant relationship has been renewed. They don't have to drag their accumulated guilt from year to year. They mm -hmm. can get a new, it's like that ball and chain is cut mm -hmm. and they have a new start. So that high priestly, uh, the one representing the many, and it says, I think in Hebrews, oh, well, this is Hebrews 6, I think, all Israel entered in oh. into the holies. Well, not literally all people, it wouldn't be a place for them. So they enter in in the person of their representative. Mm -hmm. And the people of God got that, this double representative, representative um, relationship was patently obvious. That was at the heart of their sacrificial uh, life, their worship life. And what Torrance did for me, besides highlighting that for me, was to say Jesus is talked about as the high priest, um, especially in the book of Hebrews. And, but also in John 17, Jesus in the high priestly prayer before he's arrested, he prays to his father and he says, I sanctify myself, I set mm -hmm. myself apart. Mm -hmm. Just like the high priest of old set himself apart, he sanctifies himself. He has no need to atone for his own sins because he's lived a sinless life. Um, uh, the high priest also, the Old Testament, would wear a vestment that had the 12 tri uh, stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel, mm -hmm. signifying his solidarity with Israel. Um, Jesus is representing humanity. Um, he is going to be led to the cross. At that time, he is both the high priest and the sacrificial victim all in one. Um, and fulfilling the covenant promises and taking the penalty, the judgment of sin upon himself, all of that is happening in the cross. And then before he leaves to ascend to um, the heaven, he gives the blessing of peace to his disciples. The relationship is restored. So, um, uh, and he breathes on them the Holy Spirit. The Holy mm. Spirit becomes the empowerment for them to carry on his ministry. He will continue his ministry, his continuing priesthood. He doesn't hang up his priestly vestments. 
when he goes to heaven. He doesn't even divest himself of his humanity. He continues his humanity in its glorified state after resurrection is still in heaven representing us and his priesthood still continues. Um, but now he's present to us in a different sort of way through the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So the idea of one for the many, which well, I don't think many hear about, <clears throat> is actually quite biblical. Yes. It's represented at uh, many different places uh, throughout. And of course, it finds its fulfillment in Christ. So he ends up being right the one for the many. Uh, and even in the New Testament, Romans 6, when he died, we died. That's one for the many. When he was baptized, we are baptized. Mm -hmm. We share in his, the one baptism of Jesus that started in the waters of Jordan and culminates on the cross. He took our place, identifying with us and solidarity mm -hmm. with us. And when he died, Paul says we are included in that. Mm -hmm. uh, other interesting th things uh, that I think are related to this, maybe you could talk a little bit about Jesus being the kind of, sometimes the terminology is the federal head of humanity. Mm -hmm. And also uh, uh, applying language of uh, the Jesus being the new Adam. Mm -hmm. yeah, how does that fit in? Yes, well, in my book, which you can get for the low, low price of $90, <laughs> <laughs> um, I play around with four different terminology and I'll get to the second one really speaks to that. But the first one I say, um, and it has to do with the one and the many, um, I use the word exclusive. He is the one for the many. Mm -hmm. He's not just one among many prophets. He's not just one guru that had a little more um, clear God consciousness than the rest of us. He was mm -hmm. a man ahead of his time. Mm -hmm. uh, he was not just our moral exemplar, a great moral teacher, and then we try to emulate that. He is the prophet, the teacher, the um, priest, the everything exclusively. Exclusive. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, so because of his exclusive identity as fully God and fully human. Um, but that exclusivity enables him to be the all-inclusive one. Mm. It's because of his unique identity, he is able to do the second point, exclusivity, the, the, men, the one and, uh, for the many, inclusivity, the many in the one. He's able to do that uniquely. No other person, I can't climb inside your humanity. <laughs> you know, there are barriers, but, mm -hmm. but um, what tips me off in this direction are two things, basically. One is um, what the language I find in Romans 5, verses 12 through 21. Paul uses this Adam-Christ parallelism. Mm -hmm. And he says, just as Adam, through his act of disobedience brought condemnation and judgment and death. So another man, mm -hmm. and then we hear that referred to a, a, a second Adam um, in various ways, but clearly a second Adam would jive with that. Another man through his, not only one act, his whole life of mm -hmm. obedient faithfulness brought justification and life. And so you constantly see this just as Adam started the ball rolling in a disastrous legacy <laughs> uh, st where the bottom line is we're imprisoned in sin and can't help ourselves mm -hmm. as the, the um, um, descendants of that legacy. Um, Jesus, in a way, reboots humanity, <laughs> mm -hmm. takes upon himself our flesh and takes it through every stage of human existence, doing right where the first Adam did wrong, obeying where that first Adam and Adam and Eve, first mm -hmm. humans, did wrong. Um, trusting with all his heart, where Adam and Eve are trusting themselves and deviating from God's plan. Um, so in a way, God is bend, to use T.F. Torrance's language, God is bending our rebellious wheels back to himself. Mm -hmm. Not just in a fiat, mm -hmm. snap of the fingers sort of mm -hmm. way, but by living through our humanity from day to day, moment to moment, um, responding to the Father with faithfulness, uh, that, that faithful human covenant response that I talked about previously. Uh, and in so doing, he is rewiring, he is recreating our humanity. Um, and that 
process culminates on the cross. It doesn't begin with the cross. Mm -hmm. It's, again, highlighting the significance of Jesus' whole life. The other part, so the Adam-Christ parallelism in Romans 5, the other part takes us back to who is Jesus. Um, when I read John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning, and through Him, all things came into being. Through this Word, we don't know yet. It, it seems like maybe it's a verbal word until we get to verse 14 and we realize the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Oh, that's mm -hmm. the Son of God who becomes mm -hmm. incarnate as Jesus. So we're not just talking about a verbal word. This is the Word through whom all things came to being. That same idea is in Colossians 1. It's in Hebrews 1. Mm -hmm. It's, again, replete. So this, this um, uh, the Creator Word when he takes upon himself our flesh, he can connect with us. He has a connection with our very being because it's through him our very being came into existence. Our ontological existence, the fancy terminology, is linked to our creator. You can't do that for me. Mm -hmm. I can't do <laughs> The creator word mm -hmm. becomes flesh. And so he already has this capability of, of affecting, transforming, impacting your humanity, your humanity, my humanity. Um, the Creator Word alone can recreate. Mm -hmm. That's the hard part that my students struggle with because they're not used to thinking of Jesus. They're used to thinking of Jesus as an individual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's an individual, you're an individual, and, and a great individual, he mm -hmm. does great things. Mm -hmm. But to think that he's the, the head of humanity, the creator word that is connected, that my humanity is included in him, he bound himself to my humanity, uh, that's a real challenge. But that's what I hear in scripture. Mm -hmm. Yes, that very unique and surprising connection uh, of Christ, yeah, the one for the many, yeah, and it the is many surprising. In the one, <laughs> yeah, that's that in second the, mm -hmm. inclusive, in the one. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe this is a chance to talk about the in Christ. Sure. Um, indulge me. Okay. I get excited about this <laughs> because it, this whole thing is not theoretical to me. This, this makes all the difference in how I look at the Christian life. And um, I used to... Uh, try to live a Christian life through my own efforts, I wouldn't confess to that at the time. <laughs> <laughs> that would be works righteousness, how yeah. dare I? But when I look back, I think, yeah, I was pretty much stuck in that route. Um, that's what sent me to Scotland because I always had the feeling that God was disappointed in me. Somehow, I just wasn't measuring up. I wasn't doing enough. I wasn't jumping high enough. I wasn't running fast enough. I wasn't fill in the blank enough to measure up to God's mm -hmm. acceptable standards. And so I just try harder. That's, if you buy into that recipe, you, that's what you're left with is just trying, trying harder, which will be exhausting after a while. And so when I went to Scotland, I thought, I hope there's better news <laughs> that he has to tell me that will get me out of the, off of that treadmill. Mm -hmm. um, and like I say, what we've been talking about, crisis representative substitution, the one for the many is, was liberating me, severing me from that tie, but also, it put me on a new trajectory. And when I read Ephesians 1, this is where it just kind of jumped into stark mm. um, focus. I won't read the whole chapter, but blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realm with every spiritual blessing in Christ, in Christ. In Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and acceptable in his sight, in love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons and daughters through Jesus Christ to the, pra uh, to the praise of his glorious, this is in microscopic <laughs> font, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one, in the one he loves. Mm -hmm. It's in him. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace, which he lavished lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times had reached their fulfillment, to bring unity of all things in heaven and earth 
under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might breathe to the praise of his glory. And you also were included in him Hmm. when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Lights went on. Where is this salvation? It's not just something Jesus kind of accomplished and then he retires and here's this accomplishment that he did that we tap into. This is so plain to me. The salvation is in him. It's nowhere else than in him. Mm -hmm. It's God doing surgery on the human life by taking humanity to himself and fixing it from within. And so, as Calvin says, we don't partake of, uh, if, we, if we're not united to Jesus, we can't benefit from salvation. We have to be united with him. So it's been wrought, this, this new nature, this, this recreated nature for us has been wrought in the person of Jesus. You can't separate the person and the work. That's where it, so we need to then be united with Jesus which happens by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit awakens us to faith. This is for you and unites us with with Jesus. So now we participate in this new life in Christ. That's how I hear Paul saying in Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Sounds like we're kicked to the curb. Mm -hmm. It's no longer I who live, but Christ. And then Mm -hmm. he says, but the life I now live, oh, we're still in the picture. The life I now live is lived on a totally different basis. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus becomes the source of our new life. Paul says it elsewhere, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Never quite saw that Mm -hmm. because so much of the teaching that abounds that I partook of was Jesus did something. And it's not really intricately related to him and he, he was the doer of it, but now it's done. It's like this package over here, mm-hmm. and we somehow uh, need to unpack it and make it ours and apply it to ourselves and all that kind of stuff. No, the Christian life is day to day participating in union with Him by faith. The joy of participating in His life, His accomplishments. Um, yeah. So, inclusive, um, preclusive. The many are displaced by the one, we are divested of our illusion that we operate according to an independent source apart from our true source. No, (laughs) God created us and like it or not, we can't cut ourselves off from that source. That is our source. Um, What Jesus wants to do, what God wants to do is divest us of our pseudo self, the Mm. illusion Mm that we can pull it off, that we are our own source, that we can sever ourselves from our Creator. And then the last, to finish the last four, exclusive, the one for the many, inclusive, the many in the one, preclusive, the many displaced by the the, uh, one, Um, conclusive, um, (laughs) the the one uh, for the many. Um, We are rehumanized, we are re- energized, repersonalized. Jesus' response for us doesn't mean that we don't respond. It means he enables us, he frees us from our imprisonment to sin. Paul talks about, well, Galatians 3.22 says we're imprisoned in sin. Ephesians 2 even gets more stark. We are dead. (laughs) Mm -hmm. If we are dead in sin, we can't enliven ourselves. Jesus comes to enliven us and enable us to offer our response to God in joyful gratitude because it all doesn't hinge on us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the participation part, the the enablement of the Holy Spirit to to let Jesus' life be lived in us. Wonderful. Well, that you certainly give us a a big picture, a rich and deep picture of Jesus as the one for the many. So it's no wonder you you wanted to write about that (laughs) and teach about it. And thanks for sharing uh, about it with us now. Thank you. Okay, well, I uh, just hope that you were able to hear the volume seem just a little uh, feeble, but I hope you caught much of it. Let me just share with you some thoughts that uh, I have, and then uh, uh, you're welcome to share uh, maybe some things that struck you. You remember, she begins by talking about um, how God decides to fix the fall, right? 
uh, address the sin of Adam. And interesting, she mentions about how she asks her students to play God and uh, then ask them, well, how would you fix it? And everybody comes up with instantaneous answers, right? Instant coffee for everyone. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, she, she talks about how God decides to work one at a time, right? Uh, and, uh, and, and it's taking so much of time doing that, making each one, you know, uh, given enough opportunity to respond to God. I remember Anil always asks, when is this kingdom going to come? <laughs> right? I mean, uh, I wish it came today. We are all very impatient and we want it today. But uh, God has, uh, you know, he, his, his work is very, very, um, well, different from ours. Because he wants to include the whole world, right? I mean, that's, that's the inclusive part. And uh, I'm presuming you can't do that through, a, as she says, fiat, you know, instantly. Uh, she then dis discusses about Abraham, uh, how he represents one for the many, Israel as a nation, one for, you know, the high priest also being one for the many. And then she comes to Jesus Christ. Uh, who finally is indeed the one for the many, and that is the whole world, all right? And very interestingly, um, she talks about how through his incarnation, uh, every bit of his life that he lived on the earth, uh, in every circumstance, he was redeeming humanity from the fall, from the um, you know, the, the, the struggle uh, that we have. And interestingly enough, uh, he continues his humanity in a glorified state. And uh, he continues to be a priest interceding for us. And in that respect, let me read you uh, Hebrews chapter 4. And uh, just to uh, connect with uh, what she was saying in terms of how Jesus continues to work with us. He is not, he's just not gone away. He's not on vacation. Uh, he is, he continues to work as he himself said, my father works to this day and I work, you know, with, with, with the father. So Hebrews 4, 14, we have read this many a times, but it comes out so loud and clear now. It says, therefore, since we have a great high priest, so Jesus remains the high priest who has ascended into heaven. In heaven, he's representing us. Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Verse 15, he says, uh, the apostle says, for we do not have a high priest, once again, reiterating his continuing priesthood, who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. So every bit of his humanity, his incarnation, he understands and recognizes uh, everything we go through as, as humans. But it says, we have one who has been tempted in every way. So the one has taken on the temptation of the many, just as we are, yet of course, he did not sin. So he's atoning for our sins, not for his sins, because he doesn't, uh, he is God and he is not a sinner. And therefore, Verse 16, very, very encouraging. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. In other words, this high priest is representing us every moment of our lives. We can approach him anytime, any moment. Uh, you know, and it goes on to say, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. He is interceding for us moment by moment. We can enter into that, into his presence, his heavenly presence, and he will intercede for us. In other words, he's sustaining us on a daily basis, on a moment by moment basis. Interestingly enough, I was just watching a video uh, uh, sometime back. Somebody asked the question, does God sustain the universe? Now, or has he made the universe like a, like a wound clock, and now he has left it for itself. 
or does he intervene? Now, of course, uh, you know, we really don't know the mystery of how the universe works, but I am presuming he is very much involved. He's very much hands on and he is hands on in our lives. Okay. And then uh, she picks up about Jesus being the new Adam. Uh, you know, in Adam, his sin, of course, brought the problems for all of us. But in Ad he is the new Adam. Uh, and uh, uh, here I thought, you know, I mean, I caught something which was interesting. He is one for the many, not one among many. So this, once again, proves the exclusiveness of Christ. Uh, he is the exclusive God who includes the many in him. Uh, interesting, she uses the word guru. This has become so common now that even Americans are using an Indian word, guru. Uh, so Jesus is not a guru. Uh, he is not the Vishwa guru, <laughs> like, like we are talking about. Uh, he is uh, indeed, you know, the one who has redeemed all of mankind. So Jesus is exclusive. At the same time, inclusive. Salvation is only in him, and he has included all, without exception, without favor. Jew and Gentile, right? Scythians, Parthians, <laughs> you remember that verse? Everyone included, uh, you know, uh, in him. And finally, um, Christ's continuing ministry, we read that already in Hebrews chapter 4, but his continuing ministry is done in the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit's ministry is to continue the ministry of Jesus. So he has not left us orphans. But like he himself says, he has uh, he unites us with him in his humanity in the Holy Spirit. So once again, the Holy Spirit is the ministry of the Holy Spirit is so very important, which we certainly cannot ignore. So. Uh, the interesting thing is, again, only in union with him can we succeed. We cannot succeed by ourselves. Uh, just as he, that is Jesus, is the creator, as it says uh, in, uh, uh, you know, John chapter 1, I think she was uh, mentioning that. Uh, John 1 and verse 3, through him all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. So Jesus indeed is the creator. But interestingly enough, only he can also recreate. He is the creator and only he can recreate. We cannot create, recreate ourselves. We cannot reform ourselves. We have to trust and be united in the humanity of Jesus so that he can recreate himself. How do we do that? All we do is through faith, we commit to him, unite with him. And obviously that means uh, participating in his life, which means that we commit to a lifestyle that is consistent with the character of God, right? That is the participation we have. We commit to a life that is uh, a consistent with his character. So obviously our behavior, our what we do, what we think, what we say matters, right? Uh, uh, but we do it in the strength that he gives us. And let us not forget the fact that once again, we do this also not just, you know, sitting it at home, but also including or, 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 um, connecting with the community of believers because Christ, the body, is the church. And so we connect with the community of believers and in this tremendous dynamic, Christ in us, we in him, uh, I in him, we in him, all of us together as community in him, this dynamic is constantly being, you know, uh, it is the process in which we are being recreated. One more thought, and then I'll open it up. You know, one for the many. Jesus Christ works one with one at a time. And that gives me the tremendous encouragement that he can work with me just as he can work with all, right? It's inclusive. 
uh, you know, he's, he's inclusive, but he can also exclude and work with me. In other words, I don't have to feel as though I am not important for God. He is so he is so concerned that even he would go after a lost sheep. So sometimes we might feel, you know, I mean, I'm all alone. Uh, does God really care for me? I mean, would God be interested in me, in what I am doing? Yes, he does. He works with us, you know, on an exclusive basis, but also on an inclusive basis. Uh, so uh, that is very encouraging that... Uh, uh, Christ, uh, you know, is personally involved with me as an individual, with you as an individual, and all of us as the community of believers. All right, enough said. Everything is open now for any thoughts, anything that struck you that can uh, add to our understanding today uh, from today's uh, message. Okay. Yes, I think Bertie wants to say. Yes, Bertie, go ahead. Make sure you unmute yourself. Yes. Uh, what great news for us all and uh, what a blessing it is that God has opened our hearts and minds to know about this. And so there is a purpose for our living and our lifestyle, as we said, everything is connected to Christ and we have to be aware of it in our overcoming and uh, the lives we live. I just w was wondering this in this blessing, uh, God did not make it known to the pre-fall people. You know, when the uh, when God destroyed, you know, the pre-fall. You know, in 2000, 2000 uh, at Noah's time, Noah and you know the, the few people were saved through the ark, and uh, then God started His plan. But I was just wondering, what about the pre-fall people? I mean, uh, there was. Uh, any hope for them? Were they, you know, not knowing? Uh, what is it? Sorry, I, I was on mute. Uh, I was on mute. Uh, Bertie, when yes. you say pre-fall, um, and you mentioned Noah, uh, of course, Adam and Eve comes before that. Oh, sorry, sorry, not pre-fall, pre-flood. Oh, pre-flood. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, when you thought, when you mentioned pre-fall, I thought you were talking about maybe, you know, uh, uh, the human beings know. before Adam, you know, uh, once again, science has a lot of speculation on that. Uh, pre-flood. Pre pre-flood. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, um, uh, the fact that he works with Noah <laughs> and he would take, was it hundred years when Noah was, uh, preaching and asking them to, uh, you know, repent. That shows he was working with all of them, right? Uh, but of course, they refused to repent. And uh, God, in his uh, wisdom, you know, decided to start with Noah. So once again, one for the many. Uh, but what we believe is that the atonement of Christ is applicable to the redemption of the universe. You know, one day we will have new heavens and new earth. So human beings is included. And uh, I'm presuming that, you know, as uh, the apostle says, the, the, the universe, the cosmos groans. So there is a effect on the universe as a whole. And I'm, I'm, I would like to believe that uh, the redemption is course, I mean, very specifically to humans, but also to the entire cosmos, which tells me that everybody is included. Now, how that will play out, uh, maybe we are not privy to that. Uh, we might not have all the ins and outs and all the formula there, but uh, Christ it loves everyone and everybody is included. Right. Anything else that uh, Dr. Graham said that may have uh, uh, evoked some response from you? Go ahead, buddy. The another, the another very very vital uh, blessing that we have, and uh, uh, 
for uh, for uh, in Christ is the rest promised to us. As you know, the Sabbath uh, in the Old Covenant and in the Old Testament was uh, was uh, the thing a type of rest. But the real rest, as we know, is in Christ Jesus. Uh, the rest involves, I know, in Christ uh, we are, you know, blessed with. Uh, you know, as he says, he is a helper, a guide, a comforter, our counselor, our need. He promises, he leads, he tries us, and he's in love with us. We are in love with him. The rest, now the rest uh, is sometimes I feel in the mind, and I'm sure more, quite many of us, uh, you know, struggle in our minds. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to yeah, in our minds to be able, you know, they say the battle is in the mind, uh, and somehow uh, that's sometimes discourages me a little, you know, and uh, uh, yeah, and uh, sometimes brings in negative thoughts uh, when I should not be thinking it, yeah, and uh, yeah, and uh, you may be aware of late, uh, all that is uh, connected to it, you see, uh, uh, maybe a lack of lack of. Lack of uh, this thing. Even there was a hindrance, you know, in the receiving of the word of God. As David says, I've hid your word in my heart so that I don't sin against you. And God says, let the word of God dwell richly in our. We need to be doing it because otherwise we are, uh, we can be, you know, uh, we can be uh, troubled by these negative thoughts. Right. So, but in a sense, we uh, we don't not having the rest. You see. <laughs> The rest that should be in mind also, besides uh, yeah. other things. Well, you rightly said, Bertie, that Christ is our eternal rest. And the Sabbath was a precursor to that. It was a shadow of the real rest. And in Christ, we have that rest. But uh, the fullness of that rest is, uh, is to be, is yet to be. We have been already ushered into it. And so I can, all I can say is Jesus dealt with sin. Now, uh, I just want to make a distinction there. Uh, you know, sometimes we think that uh, Jesus only dealt with the effect of sin, right? The effect of sin is all the misery and the suffering that we go through. Uh, no, Jesus just didn't come to deal with the effect of sin, but with sin itself. He had to take away the sin altogether. And of course, the effect is taken care of. So, uh, but unfortunately, we still in our present state struggle with the, uh, uh, you know, with, the, with you could say, a sinfulness. Uh, and that's a daily struggle. And uh, all we can uh, hang on to, even as Hebrews chapter 4 says, Come to the throne of God. Come to his grace. Uh, he will bless you with that rest. And now I know sometimes it is, uh, we don't understand fully why we might not experience it in its fullness. Uh, but he is, I mean, let's not forget that he is, his grace is being dispensed on, you know, on a moment by moment basis. So every moment, uh, all I can say is we are encouraged to come to him. And in some way, form or fashion, he will bring in, bring that, that rest, you know, so that we can, we can experience a sense of peace, even while we go through turmoil. Yeah. Thank you, Bertie. Right. Yes, Anil, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> This uh, doctrine of one for many, that I mean, she explained it very well, quoting the scriptures and so on. But I mean, this is this is not something new that uh, you know we have found out or something. This is what we have believed in all. Or this is the very basic, the very foundation of our faith, actually. If you see, so. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, I don't want to say I didn't find anything new in what she said, but yeah. definitely she expounded it very well with quoting the scriptures and so on. But that concept that Jesus died for many and then he rose and, and he's right. in a means by which everybody is being saved, it has been there all along, right? Absolutely. I mean, I think she was um, probably trying to uh, give it 
uh, incarnational Trinitarian perspective, you know, bringing in, uh, of course, Jesus' incarnation and his connection with the Father, and then mm. the continuing ministry of the Holy Spirit, and the fact that Jesus continues in his incarnational ministry to us, right? Mm -hmm. So one for the many, he has and he has enfleshed himself. He continues to hold on to the humanity now, of course, in a glorified sense. So I think those aspects may be uh, something which is uh, probably a little bit more novel to us, mm -hmm. right? And I think the important thing is how do we how do we live our lives now? And we know that Christ is constantly interceding for us as our high priest and in his humanity, and he can work one on one, right? He uh, he's 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 not just looking for a big audience. He's looking also one on one, and he's included everybody. But yes, I mean it's a basic doctrine. Um, uh, I don't know if. Uh, uh, any any other exclusive aspects that some of you may have uh, 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 you know recognized there? Uh, just looking at the time. Right. Seven minutes. Okay. All right. All right. Well. Um, uh, if we have no more comments or thoughts, uh, uh, it was it was a pleasure. Yeah, Anil, you wanted to say something else? Uh, you're on mute, yeah. Yeah, just a, a little aside, not directly related to this, but I guess this is a very big question. Why didn't God give Adam and Eve a second chance? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, you mean no, you say, could have said you could have said, "Look, guys, you really messed up big time. Let's uh, start all over again, right?" <clears throat> okay. <laughs> so, um, uh, what you're saying when you say a second chance, you mean that, hey, now you messed up by uh, eating the fruit of this tree. I'll I'll cancel, you know, the cancel <laughs> culture. <laughs> Correct. I'll cancel it all, and I'll again take you into the garden and. Give you the opportunity, right? Is that I think that's what you mean? Yeah, something like that. Yes. Uh, once again, obviously, I I cannot venture into God's mind and uh, give you the answer. Uh, it, it's worth thinking about it. But you know, when you say a second chance, there is already a second chance. Adam and Eve has a second chance because we have a second Adam. True. In the second In Adam, sense. there is and. All I can say is, what if Adam and Eve messed up again? Again? <laughs> well, then, of course, this whole sweep of history begins. Right? <laughs> so, in in the second Adam, we, we are absolutely certain there would be no, no mess up. <laughs> so, in that respect, we can take, uh, uh, we can take heart, you know, that, uh, yeah. yeah, God made sure that we do. That second chance definitely works. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I think uh, time well spent, hopefully, for all of us. Uh, pleasure to have you all. <coughs> Maybe um, uh, I can request Anil, uh, if you can, close in prayer for us. Okay. <clears throat> Let's pray. <clears throat> Almighty God in heaven, <clears throat> we come before you, Lord. Thanking you so much for the wonderful blessings that you shower upon us. Father, the blessing of meeting each week and discussing your plan and discussing you, discussing Jesus Christ, giving you the glory and the thanks and the praise all the time, Lord. Lord, we are very, very grateful for this technology that allows us to meet like this, God. We continue to pray for your guidance to each and every one of us. Lord, look over us as we go about, Lord, and help us, God, to really understand deep in what you're trying to teach us, Lord. Some of the things we don't understand, we acknowledge that. But whatever is needed for salvation and for our 
life forward. You have very clearly mentioned in the scriptures. So help us, Lord, to concentrate on those and, and shape our lives as Jesus wants us to, Lord. We do pray that may Jesus help, help us in bringing our lives in alignment with your will, Lord. And Father, thank you once again. We continue to ask for your blessing upon all of us, Father. And we pray and ask all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 And thank you all. God bless you. Have a good uh, rest of the day, either an evening or a, or a, or a whole day. <laughs> Bye-bye. Take, take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah, God bless. Good night. Good night. Good night. Kevin, sir. Kevin, sir. How, how are you feeling? I'm, oh. much, I'm much better now, Uncle. Okay. And how is, how is Clara? How is Clara? Uh, Clara is also better. What do you work? What do you work done? Huh? Work is done. You will get it day after tomorrow. Yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. God bless. Okay. Thank you.